great things achieved in the agency, fellas. I'd like to introduce EHN first, and then Robin will share a little bit more about the Mr. Mortgage team. Um, so what you see here is the team that you most likely will be working with if you decide to move forward with EHN. And the majority of us have either lived abroad or come from abroad. Um, so we know what it's like to move to a new country, set up a new home and feel at home there. So that's very important for us. Um, also, um, what we are not is traditional real estate agents. So we don't have a background in real estate in the sense of that we move bricks or that we're kind of like for the deals. We have, a, there's kind of like the stereotype of a real estate agent in the Netherlands, like a very slick dude on a little moped that wears a striped suit and just tries to kind of close all these deals. No, we're in it to actually help people find home and feel at home. Uh, we help with buying and renting, not selling. Um, so we focus on one process only for you and that is actually helping you buy a home. We've become very proficient at it. Uh, we charge a fixed fee, no commissions, and we know what it's like to sell into a new country. Um, some of you might ask, what's the added value of working with EHN? Well, selling agents take our offers more seriously because we've done due diligence. They know we were not, we're not gonna submit any offers if we're not a serious party. We can sometimes book in viewings when it's no longer possible, and we support, support by reviewing legal documents. And one of the most important things, we actually help with defining the market value of the property. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And of course, we'll inform you about rules and regulations and we'll make sure that you don't make the same mistakes that we made. Um, my name is Kimo, by the way. I didn't introduce myself yet. And uh, uh, I am the founder of Expert Housing Network and I've helped a lot of people buy a home, but now my team or the team is actually uh, taking care of that. And honestly, they've become much better at it than I have ever been. So that's a good sign. Uh, Robin, the floor is yours. Yes, great. Thank you. Thank you all for, for joining today, this, uh, this, uh, this morning. Um, I'm from Mr. Mortgage. My name is Robin Uitenhagen. Uh, sometimes we uh, give, a, give out a poll there for people that were able to pronounce my name correctly the first time they get our service for free. <laughs> but now I already gave it away. So sorry for that. Mm -hmm. um, so from Mr. Mortgage, um, we take care of, um, uh, well, obviously the mortgage, but not only that, um, well, same as uh, Kimo just mentioned, uh, we're not in it to just only do the transfer. We guide you through the whole process of buying and financing. Um, obviously we're not, not buyer's agents. Uh, we're ex uh, we experts at the financial part of the, uh, of the process. And also we believe that please keep doing what you are best at. So don't try to kind of also be a seller's agents and also, or uh, buyers agents to uh, to do finance as well. So we like to keep uh, our uh, expertise is where it is. And I'm joined with uh, with a magnificent team of uh, Cesar, uh, one of the other financial specialists, and uh, yeah, same as uh, Uskan. Well, Uskan uh, takes the care of the most of the the, the back office. So he's he's kind of our our uh, mortgage Google, if you will. He knows everything. There's every uh, anything uh, ever has to be known about mortgages in any case. So that's uh, for him to go with. And um, the wonderful Eagle uh, or Egler, but we call it Eagle to be honest, uh, <laughs> our growth market here. And so, so that's uh, that's our, our team. Um, we uh, do things a bit differently from a bank. For one, um, we work with over 30 banks. So we can really always fine tune the best uh, option for your specific needs and also our service level is a bit higher we really uh, appreciate the personal uh, touch to a service also when it comes to kind of a dry information uh, which mortgages and finances undoubtedly is but um, we want to be your guide that you at least know your way around the maze it doesn't have to be rocket science uh, you just have to know your way around and have to know the rules and regulations and what to be aware of so those are the most important things that's what we do and what we love doing as well and uh, so yeah that's um, that's what we love to help you with perfect thanks for the intro uh, ludo uh, this is the first time maybe you can also introduce yourself sure thing well my name um, is ludo as you all can see, uh, I'm a buying agent at EHN. Uh, started as a team assistant, um, now I've grown through to a, a buying agent. What I do is I help all my clients find a perfect home in the Netherlands, uh, mostly focused on the Amsterdam metropolitan area. Um, but um, I have enough colleagues uh, around uh, the whole Netherlands, um, so we can um, even find you a home in Groningen. So. <laughs> that would be me. Thanks for the intro. Thanks for the intro. And maybe good to mention is that Inidio joined us and he started as a, a team assistant. And what he did during that time is 
do a lot of property document reviews, but one of the most important things he did, and he's become a master at it, is defining market values of properties. And I think that's, well, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but if you have any questions about that, Ludo is your go-to guy as well. Um, today's the goal is to add value to you, so we believe in sharing information freely. Um, if you have any questions, again, pop them into Q&A, and we'll try and answer them as good as possible. Some things that are good to know, um, one is National Mortgage Guarantee, this is already a little bit old news. It changed from last year to this year. It went up. Um, a bit of background information. Um, National Mortgage Guarantee uh, was instated when uh, the global financial crisis hit. They wanted to protect people that had properties that were worth less than the mortgage was that they had outstanding, and they would end up with a deficit if they were forced to sell. So what they said is, let's create a guarantee system where you can actually sign up to if your property is worth no more than 325,000 euros. So you can actually buy a property for 340K, but if the market value is 325K, as the appraiser says it, then you can actually apply for National Mortgage Mortgage guarantee. What does it do? It gives you the guarantee. Let's say you lose a job, you lose a limb, you lose a partner, God forbid, and you're forced to sell. And it turns out that your mortgage is higher than the value of your property. Then that deficit is actually covered by the mortgage guarantee. Two things good to know. One, it costs a little bit of money to actually get the mortgage guarantee. And the second thing is, is that banks will give you a better interest rate if you have the mortgage guarantee. We'll talk a little bit about the actual cost, but this is a uh, um, very nice thing to have and especially if you're able to buy a property with the value of up to 325k robin maybe you could share a little bit more about the transfer tax rules or regulations yeah sure thing um so transfer tax is something that you have to pay when you um, when the uh, property is transferred to you uh, your ownership um regularly you have to pay two percent transfer tax in any case it has been uh, uh, six and eight percent but that's a long time ago luckily um, but as of the start of 2021, uh, there are some changes that have been made. So if you're under 35 and you buy a property for no more than 400,000 euros, um, then you don't have to pay transfer tax at all. Um, you can apply for this once in the time between uh, the start of this year and the end of 2024. So you can use it once. It doesn't matter if you already own the property or not, um, uh, but you can only use that dispensation once uh, that time. So here are three scenarios. Uh, Kate is single on the left um, and uh, under 35. Uh, purchase price is 400,000 euros. So it's up to 400,000 euros. Then you don't have to pay transfer tax. Mm -hmm. Now, when there's a combination, so a couple, uh, first time home buyers, uh, meaning that they buy a home within this time span. Um, Kate is 37 and John is 33. Um, then Kate does pay 2% transfer tax over her part, usually 50% of the property. Um, and then John doesn't pay anything. So then you pay 2% uh, over the half of the uh, purchase price. In the end, you pay 1% over the total amount. Same thing, really. Um, when it's on, the, on the right side, um, there's another scenario, and that is, uh, again, a, a bit more complicated. So if it would be the case that John, uh, Kate and John both 33, so under 35, so you would say they don't have to pay transfer tax. Sure. But um, John is a first-time home buyer in the time between 2021 and 2024. But Kate already bought a home uh, in that time span. Then Kate still does have to pay tra a transfer tax of 2%, but John does not. So sure, it can be a bit uh, complicated to really find out what the best uh, option is for you. Um, uh, the, there's a button right there, visit the transfer tax checker. That's on our website. So you can always check if your specific situation uh, would require you to pay transfer tax, or you can always check in with your financial specialist to check if that uh, applies to you. Perfect. Thanks for sharing, Robin. Um, so another quick question for you guys. Where in the process are you? We'd always like to love to find out like where you are. Are you or like, like still orientating or are you in a research phase? Have you actually started viewing properties? We open up a quick poll. Please feel free to share your answers and then... Um, that helps us a little bit. Um, did you actually chat with an agent? Did you chat with a mortgage broker? We're very curious to find out if you haven't chatted to a mortgage broker or if you have, um, if you have chatted with one, the same thing applies for the agent and we'll tell you things today. Very curious to find out what you learned and what not. Um, the majority of you are actually still researching. There's a few people that are actually viewing properties. No one's made an offer yet. Ah, we have our first offer in. I hope it was accepted. Um, if not, don't lose hope. There's plenty of, uh, well, I wouldn't say plenty of properties out there, but there's properties out there and you will find something at some point. 
Okay, the majority of you have not chatted with an agent yet. Some of you actually have. I'm very curious to see what we'll share with you that's new for you. The same thing applies for when you've talked to a mortgage broker. Thanks a lot for sharing your answers. Renting versus buying, Robin. Yes, renting versus buying. So when you're considering uh, moving to the Netherlands or living in the Netherlands and you want to move, then you should consider if you want to rent or you should buy. Um, now, even though we're called Mr. Mortgage, we don't necessarily want to push you towards uh, buying. The most important thing is that you feel comfortable in the choices that you make. Because there are some pros to, uh, to renting as well. For one, there's the flexibility. Uh, you have flexibility to move from one to another, if you find one, of course, uh, but you don't have to go around selling your house and all of that. So that's nothing to worry about. So that's flexibility. You don't have to pay taxes over owning the property. You don't have to take care of the maintenance of the whole building. Sure, inside your, uh, your own property, sure. Make sure that that's well maintained, but the uh, maintenance of the property is uh, of itself. That does not something that you have to take care of. And you don't have a down payment in the sense of a large investment that you have to do to, uh, uh, to have your mortgage. Now, um, when it comes to owning your own, uh, some downsides are that you do have to pay taxes. You do have to take care of the maintenance of the property, and it can be a bit harder to move. Now, that's kind of subjective because right now it's quite easy to sell your house, but still it's a process that you have to go through. Um, but if you're still interested in uh, buying a home, then let's take a look at the pros of buying a home. So for one, you have stability because the, seller, uh, the, the owner of the property is you. And so uh, you don't have a landlord or landlady that can increase the, inter uh, the, uh, the rental price, for instance. In your monthly payment, you don't only pay interest, definitely something you do have to pay, but you also pay repayment of the mortgage. So you repay a bit of your debt and therefore you build up equity in your property, so value in your property. And one other thing, the mortgage interest rate that I just mentioned, you have a tax deduction. So a, essentially you have a tax benefit over the interest that you pay. Now with renting your uh, home, like I mentioned, rents will probably keep on rising. There's no tax benefit and you don't create wealth in the property value. So those are definitely cons to buy your own property. Um, now, we also gave out uh, a setup and uh, a comparison here, renting versus buying. Now, if you rent similar properties, the, on the left, you can see the rental price being 2,250 per month. And on the right side, you can see that based on an interest rate of 158, which is now definitely quite a bit lower, but then your monthly payment would be 1,832. So you'd see a difference there already. But with buying, you do have to consider the closing fees, what I mentioned with the down payment or investment at the first uh, place. That's around 23,080 euros in this case. Um, then when you compare the two, um, and then it's important to find out at what stage do you actually um, uh, earn back essentially those clear closing fees. And that's within 15 months. So let's say one and a half year. Now, then saying, well, it makes sense to buy when you stay at least one and a half year in the, house, uh, in the same property, that's a bit too quick because usually stay around five years because then you can see right here, cash at hand is then around 70,000 euros in this situation. But also, then you really start getting uh, the investment, the benefits, you're reaping the benefits of the investment as well. Um, so it doesn't really make sense that, uh, to buy property when you want to stay there for one or two years, for instance. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'll share a little bit more about the market. Everyone knows that it's going up at the moment. We've seen plenty of news articles in the uh, in the papers that says that people are overbidding, that um, there's a shortage in the housing market. And I just want to give you some context because we get a lot of questions from people that say, is this a good time to buy? And I think it helps to understand where in the process of the market we are and also why prices are going up. And I think the last one is the most important one. And one of the reasons why prices are going up is because of fiscal benefits. So we've created a environment environment where it's very interesting to buy a home and to own a home. One of these things is tax exemption. Robin talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, if you meet the criteria, you don't have to pay transfer tax. What we're seeing though, is that people are putting the transfer tax money back into the offer. So that has driven the prices up a little bit. The interest rebate, Robin talked about it as well. You can deduct it off your taxable income, makes it very interesting to actually buy and own a home because, hey, your interest uh, payments technically go down. Also, there's no capital gain. So if you were to buy a home and you sell it again, then the money that you earn, you can put back into a new property without actually having to pay taxes over it. So also that 
drives prices up and there's tax-free donation to kids from parents. So up to a certain amount, you can actually donate a certain amount tax-free. So what we're seeing is especially some of the more wealthier parents are giving their kids some money to actually invest into a property. Um, all of these things make it very interesting to buy homes, own homes, and um, at the low interest rates there, um, money is cheap at the moment, right? Compared to five to 10, 20 years ago, uh, there's a lot of percentages and difference between what you're paying now, between 1.5 and 2%. Um, so that in combination with the high rents, like you, the majority of you have already mentioned, and a lack of supply creates a big kind of like discrepancy between supply and demand. The more and more people are buying, less and less properties will be actually uh, offered to buy. Um, at this point, we're seeing, a, uh, uh, we're seeing a number of properties on the market drop a little bit because also we're not building fast enough. The Netherlands is very well known, well, within the Netherlands at least, for not meeting the quota. So um, in order to actually get to the amount of properties that we need, we need to build a little bit faster. Luckily, they're ramping it up right now, but that effect will be seen in a couple of years. So um, what that means is, is that currently, prices will continue to go up. And um, I don't expect the government to change any of these fiscal benefits. Neither do I expect the um, central banks to increase the, uh, the the interest by much anytime soon, um, maybe a little bit, but I think that we'll see more money go into the market, more people looking to rent or to buy a house because rents are also increasing because private investors are buying up properties and they're putting it back into the rental market, right? So there's a lot of people that can't buy a property yet. You are most likely one of the lucky ones. Um, so yes, would you ask me, is this a good time to buy? I would say is this a, it's a good time as any, uh, but like Robin says, don't buy for a period of one or two years because we don't know what's going to happen in the foreseeable the foreseeable future i expect the price to go up but from an investment point of view it doesn't make sense right it also becomes speculation because if the value were to drop in two years a little bit um, and you've bought now or you've bought in a year from now and you only keep it for a year then there's a risk there keep it for a little bit longer because first of all you build up that equity second of all if there's any kind of like dip in the market you should be able to weather it for a longer period of time um, and a problem is not a problem until you're confronted with it right like there's no problem in a decreasing housing price until you sell. So make sure you understand that, well, buying a property is not for the short term. Um, also, what would you need in savings before you start? We've created three columns. Um, I'm gonna sum it up a little bit. If you pay transfer tax, take into account you'll buy, you'll pay up to 5% of the purchase price. If you don't pay transfer tax, it's more close to 3%. Um, there's a few things I'm gonna highlight here. Um, and those are the costs that are tax deductible. Um, what does that mean? Well, at the end of the year, you can deduct the cost of some of these things off your income tax or you know, what's it, the taxable income. Um, and all the costs that are tax deductible are related to the mortgage because the government wants to motivate you to actually get support when it comes to a mortgage. So the notary will draft the mortgage deed, the bank or your mortgage advisor, the Mr. Mortgage guys will actually support you with acquiring the mortgage. The appraiser will define the actual market value that the bank will accept. Um, and if you take on the extra mortgage guarantee, that also costs some money. So um, <clears throat> make sure you understand that. Um, I wouldn't um, try and save any any money if you actually go and talk to, um, uh, to mortgage specialists, because I think that they're worth their penny uh, well, every penny. Um, I always kind of like compare a bank and a mortgage advisor to a bank is an old fashioned retail shop. You go in there to try to sell you their products. The mortgage advisor has a range of like 40, 50 products that they can actually support you with. Um, and they don't care where you buy as long as you're happy, you understand what you're buying, it works for you and you look good in it. So um, have a chat with that, with the guys from Mr. Mortgage. And um, I would also advise you to chat with the bank just to get a good feel for what's going on, right? So. That's the um, amount of money that you need in savings. Again, so 5% of the purchase price if you have to pay transfer tax, 3% and it's close to the, um, those amounts. It could be a little bit less, could be a little bit lower, uh, could be a little bit more, but 3% if you don't have to pay transfer tax. Okay, so three tips to win in the current housing market. This is one of the most important things. Value, 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 value. A lot of people ask me, how much should I overbid over the asking price? And I tell you, don't look at the asking price. That is the wrong reference. Why? Let's look at this property. It's on the market for 395. Um, and what is going to happen is the 
selling agent defines the asking price. He's very free in that, right? And it's relatively, well, it's not super subjective, but he can play around with this. Um, the market value, however, is not that much subjective. There's a range there as well, but the market value is defined by properties sold in the past six to 12 months that are similar. Um, so the market value is 415. Let's say somebody purchased it for 435. Then the asking price, the difference between asking price and purchase price is about 10%. The difference between market value and purchase price is about 5%. Let's say we have the same property, but an agent who's a little bit more opportunistic. He puts the property up for 375,000 euros because he thinks he'll get more people in. Um, he also wants to impress the seller. The value of the property, however, is not different. And well, let's say we use the same purchase price as before. Um, then suddenly the difference between asking price and purchase price becomes 16%. So if we use this narrative, then people will start thinking about offering, I'll have to offer 15, 16, 20% over. Uh, but the difference between market value and the purchase price is no different whatsoever. Let's say you apply the 16% on the previous real estate agent's property, right? It's the same property, but the price is a little bit higher. Then you would be paying more than you actually have to. So I would advise you always look at the market value. Ludo is our specialist. Everyone within the HN team can actually help you with that. But make sure you understand what the market value is before you submit that offer. Okay, then what is a winning offer? There's a few things I would like to highlight. It's not always the highest price. It's a good price, right? Let's look at the um, previous, well, let's, look, let's take the previous slide. The property was on the market for 395. Um, the value is 415 and somebody offered 435, but you are gonna offer 450, but you only have 20 gain savings. Well, let me go back to the slide because it makes it a little bit easier. You only have 20 gain savings. The market value is 415. The bank is not gonna give you more than this money, this much money. So technically you should only be able to buy the property for this amount of money, but you went over because you think, hey, I need to over offer 16% over at 395. Um, and that means that, well, you end up paying three or 450. But if the selling agent gets wind of the fact you only have 20K in savings, he's not gonna go for your offer because the selling agent wants to sell and he wants a price that you can actually make and that is still a reasonable price. So offer a good price, don't always offer the highest price and always look at the market value. Second is security to the seller. The seller will want to know that you're gonna move forward. There's a couple of things. First of all, do your due diligence, right? Get support from a specialist like us or do your due diligence yourself. The second thing is, is that if you put all these clauses in the contract or in the, in the, in the offer, sorry, that allow you to pull out when things don't go your way, then the seller will not enjoy that because the seller doesn't want to start the process all over again after a month or two months. So one of those important things is the finance clause, it means if you don't get the mortgage, you're going to pull out. Um, that's something that takes about four weeks after purchase contract signing. So it takes about eight weeks from the moment you submit an offer to the moment that the uh, seller is actually aware if you're going to move forward or not. And that's not going to uh, land well if you especially compete with an offer that doesn't have a finance clause. However, disclaimer, never take it out without support from a financial specialist and your agent, because I think it is a risk there. So you want to make sure you understand what you're offering. That's why it's always good to have somebody on your side. The other one, least amount of hassle. One of the biggest um, points is the seller sometimes buys a new property, can only move in the 1st of February. If you ask him to move out the 1st of October, then that's going to mean a lot of hassle for him because he has to move his stuff out, store it, find a new place temporarily, and then move his stuff to, into his new home. Um, unless you can back it up with a really good offer, I would find out what ticks and what drives the seller. Um, and if you understand that, then you can tailor make your offer also based on what the seller is looking for. Um, the other one is offer personal touch. I would say share a little bit more about yourself, share some photos, tell them why you really like the property, because especially if you're up against, for example, an investor and the seller has lived in the property himself for a while, then he is emotionally attached. So he will like to know who's going to move in and that's not gonna be used for kind of like an investment purposes. So I think that could add some value to your offer. The last thing is due diligence. We talked about it before. Make sure you understand what you're buying. Two things you need to do. The technical inspection, get somebody in to actually inspect the property and understand what the conditions of the property, what needs to be done. The second one is the appraiser. They define the market value. A bank will not give you a mortgage without that valuation report. What the appraiser does, he comes to the property, inspects it, takes photos, goes back to the office, does the majority of the work in the office, then comes up with a report. He has to file it with an independent institute to make sure he play by the rules. If they approve of it, then it goes to the bank. Okay, my question to you guys is, 
do you book these guys before or after your offer is accepted? And I think this is maybe something you can actually pop in the chat. Do you book them before or after your offer is accepted? After from Tarek with a question mark. Not super sure. That's fine. Before, after, before. Oh, we got some mixed. Um, I'm not going to hold you any longer. Some people say before. It was a bit of a trick question. Uh, why? Because it's process related, right? And you book these guys in after the offer is accepted. Why? Because if you book them in before, you'll pay for them. And if your offer is not accepted, you'll lose out on that money. You're not committed to the deal yet when your offer is accepted. You're only committed when you've signed that bridge contract and three days thereafter have expired. So after that period, after the cool off period, that's what we call it, you're committed to the deal. Before that, you can pull out without giving any reason. You might incur some costs like the inspector, the appraiser, and maybe some notary costs, but technically you can pull out without paying any major fines. So get these guys in after your offer is accepted. Why is that important? Because the bank, again, will want to know what the value is and you'll want to know what the condition of the property is. If you've submitted an offer and you're not 100% sure about the valuation, then it's going to be even more important to get a valuation report. And why? Because if you find out that the value is lower than what you expected and it happens after the cool off period ends, then you're stuck. And then unless you have a finance clause in your offer, then you cannot pull out without, uh, uh, without paying a major fine. So make sure you get these reports preferably before the bridge contract is signed because it allows you also a little bit to negotiate. And if that's not possible, get them before the cool off period ends. My last comments are about the timeline and then we have some room for, I think the frequently asked questions. Um, the timeline is a little bit skewed on this part. So you start to search once your offer is submitted or approved, congratulations. This might however take weeks, months, depending on what you're looking for. Then you book the appraiser and technical inspector in. You also sign a bridge contract. The mortgage application technically is finalized after the bridge contract is uh, signed. Don't wait to talk to Mr. Mortgage until this moment. Talk to them already right now because they'll be able to help you and you can prepare a lot to make this process go much smoother. Then your cool-off period ends and then you have about four weeks to get your mortgage approved, but technically the guys from Mr. Mortgage can do it much faster, so no pressure there, but they're really good at what they do. Um, and then you have about seven to 10 days before you get the keys to the property, the notary will send you a final statement of completion. I call it kind of like the, the payoff. What does that mean? You have your mortgage or you have the bridge price, then you have the bridge costs, which we talked about, three or 5%, depending on what you're looking at. And then you deduct the mortgage of it. And that remains a certain amount you have to pay. You have to pay that into the notary account before you actually become the owner and get the keys. On the day that you become the owner, you'll go to the property first, inspect it. And then if it's in a good condition, you'll go to notary, sign, get the keys and become a proud owner of a home and a mortgage. Let's say you move in the day after, you find out something is not working that should have been working. Technically, you have two months to inform the seller about that. Don't wait too long because the longer it takes before you inform the seller, the more difficult it becomes for you to prove that it's already the case when you moved in. So inform them ASAP and then you can still hold them liable. It's a reasonable period, two months, but if you wait too long, then the seller most likely will say, nope, this was working when I gave you the key. So Maybe it's just bad luck. It broke down when you moved in, right? Uh, make sure you understand that. Um, this timeline can take anywhere up to from three to nine months, depending on what's on the market, how lucky you are with your offer, and especially how competitive you can actually make your offer. So frequently asked questions. This is the place where Ludo shines. I think he's already shown in the background as well, answering a lot of these questions. So super happy to see that. Ludo, maybe you can take it from here. For sure. Thank you very much. Always my favorite part when I can uh, start to talk and let people hear my voice. <laughs> um, the first one is for you, Robin. Uh, the question goes as following. Can I get a mortgage with a temporary contract or as a freelancer? Uh, thanks. Um, yes, you can. Um, uh, to, to give you a bit of a background, uh, let's talk with the temporary contract. Essentially, um, a bank will want to know that you're good for your income for not only now, but also in the future. Uh, when you have a temporary contract, um, usually what the bank will uh, require is a so-called bank uh, um, employer statement. That's what they will need anyway. Also, when you have an indefinite contract, uh, but especially with a temporary contract, because on that employer statement, there's an option a box that the employer can tick, and there says that there's a declaration of intent. That means that your employer, with the same uh, uh, performance, if your performance stays the same. Then after your temporary contract, they're intending to give you a permanent contract. Now that's not legally binding in any way, shape or form, but it does give the bank sufficient trust to give you the mortgage based on your full income. So nothing to worry about there. Now, if that's not possible, 
then there's still possibilities to close a mortgage on your temp temporary contract. So it could be that we can use a bit less of your income, but still manageable. And then we just have to see um, if that still meets your requirements when it comes to the mortgage that you want to close. So definitely something to look into. When it comes to being a freelancer or an entrepreneur, self-employed essentially, um, then it's also possible. Um, the, um, what you would be able to read on the internet usually is that you need three years um, of history in your company. Now that's not necessarily the, the case. You don't need a full three years. One year being 12 months or 365 days, that is the minimum that you need as a history in your company. Now, it does make sense to kind of see um, maybe a bit more time or to at least have a good idea that you expect that your income from the, your uh, uh, self-employment or being a freelancer will be continuous. Because it's not only the bank that we have to convince, it also has to make sense in your personal finance situation. So by all means, uh, have your situation checked out by a financial specialist and see if it not only makes sense to the bank, but also to your financial uh, situation. Do you know any uh, good financial specialists? Let me check. Yeah, one or two. <laughs> cool. Thanks for that. Uh, well, we're moving on to you, Kimo. Um, question, what happens if you want to leave the country after several years? Good question. So Robin, at the beginning of the presentation, mentioned if you buy a home, don't buy it for a short period of time. I confirmed that buy it for at least around five years or preferably longer. Um, but you guys are from abroad. Who knows what's going to happen, right? You might have to leave again because you're relocated to another country or you might want to leave, go back home or who knows, right? So there's that level of insecurity there. But luckily, there's definitely a lot of ways to actually manage around that. So one is, of course, you can keep your home, but you'll have your mortgage cost. That's the um, least, least kind of like smart option. You can do it, but if it's empty and you have mortgage costs, it's just a waste of money, right? The second one is you can actually rent out your home, but please note, you need permission from your bank to do this. If it's for a short period of time, then they might be a little bit easier on you, but if it's for a long period of time, they might actually request you to change your mortgage. I think Robin will maybe share a little bit more about that in a few. The third one is you can sell your home without penalty, or capital gains tax. So if you sell your home, you don't have to pay a penalty to pay off your mortgage completely, right? That's fine. They actually uh, are okay with that. And like I mentioned before, there's no capital gain tax. So you actually can take some of their profit with you. Um, we see a lot of people actually going for the second option, um, especially if they're leaving after a year or two, right? It still makes sense to have somebody else pay off your mortgage and uh, uh, build up a little bit of equity through that. The third one is also something that we see every now and then, but that's more for people that are actually leaving permanently. Um, so it is fine to have a home while you're not living in the Netherlands. Perfect. Um, then a follow-up question about that, especially the renting part for you, Robin. Is it possible mm -hmm. to actually rent out my house or, or part of a room? Uh, yes, uh, well, it's possible. Um, by all means, when you buy an apartment, do check with the homeowner association as well, if they allow you to do so, uh, because they might have some rules and regulations that are regarding that. A uh, homeowner association is essentially an association of homeowners, it's pretty obvious, in an apartment building. Um, but uh, there are possibilities uh, for sure. Um, when you do, when you uh, rent out a room, um, essentially you would be able to get a, a roommate, and then when he or she pays for uh, the, uh, the use of the room, then you can rent it out. Do note that when you rent out a room, that is something that will be taxed. So you have to pay tax over that to, from a certain amount. When you rent out your complete home, that is not that rental income is not taxed. So that can be a benefit right there. So it is possible. But it's very important to understand the rules and regulations from different lenders um, because the major no lender will allow you to rent out the property when you have a residential mortgage. No lender will allow you to do that. So if you do that, then it's on you. So then if they find out that you 100% have to repay the full mortgage in a relatively short amount of time. And I kind of already hear the questions, what is a relatively short amount of time? That's around, let's say, two or three months, then you really have to sell or repay the full mortgage. Now, it's harder to sell your house when there's somebody living in there because they have rights. So then it might mean that you have less right, uh, less income over that. Um, but it is possible uh, just um, for one, if you uh, leave the property uh, for a short amount of time because you go abroad and then a short amount of time is one to three years, um, then the majority of lenders will allow you to keep the residential mortgage and then uh, rent it out. If it's permanent or uh, for a longer stretch of time, then you would have to refinance your mortgage. Still possibilities, but then your residential mortgage, your 
basic regular mortgage will have to be turned into an investment mortgage. Again, there are sufficient options there. Just make sure that you're well informed. But um, so a <laughs> short answer, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Love the short answer, great. <laughs> Always nice to have a recap. Um, a question uh, probably all the viewers are, are asking themselves as well. Uh, we'll start with you, Kimo. Did COVID have any impact on the mortgages and housing market? Well, let's focus on the housing market with you. Yeah, um, so it, it did have an impact. Housing became more important than ever because people were stuck in them. So um, initially, the first couple of months, people were a little bit afraid. Crises always do that, right? Um, I also was maybe a little bit less optimistic until like government started kicking in with uh, all these um, uh, policies and um, supporting schemes. So um, I think we've managed the impact quite well, uh, even though we spend a lot of money on it as a, a government and uh, central banks. But um, what we're seeing is that because people were locked down in their homes, suddenly they started looking at their homes differently. So we saw a big spike in the number of people looking to buy homes, um, I think closer to the end of summer last year. So it's picked up. Initially, we saw people leaving the city because they wanted more space now that cities are a little bit safer and with the vaccination programs kicking in we're seeing people come back to the city again so it's kind of like uh, the tides coming in um will it have an impact moving forward i think so i think that we don't know yet what the impact will be of all the support schemes of uh, maybe a winter that will kind of like increase um infections but luckily will not have the same impact as it has before due to vaccinations. But I do think that we'll see something, right? Um, and it could very well be that um, inflation is going up. Well, we saw, I think the recently report came out that the inflation was a little bit higher than before. I think it's closer to the 3% in the, in the EU. Um, if that continues, then salaries at some point will go up, uh, costs will go up, and also for banks and name it. And I think that might have an impact also on interest rates in the foreseeable future. So um, I think now you can still benefit from relatively low interest rates, um, but maybe in the foreseeable future, in a year or two years, we might actually see the interest rate go up at some point. Um, we don't know what kind of like effect it has on the um, employment market. Um, like it's very difficult to understand like very macroeconomic uh, uh, impacts that it has. But from experience, like I have a startup on the side as well, we're seeing that well, unemployment rates are super low. Um, so it's very difficult to get get talent in. What that means is that we'll see more and more people um, being hired from abroad. Um, and I think that will impact the housing market in a positive way as in the price, I think will will go up in the, in the short term. Um, but we're also seeing, of course, that on the other side that you have like restaurant owners, people that have been actually benefiting from these subsidies and schemes that at some point they will have to say, sorry, but my business is not viable anymore. I was actually able to survive because of this, um, but with uh, without the, the subsidies, it might have an impact on that how big that will be is very difficult but again i think that if you're to buy a home um, make sure you don't buy it for a year or two because if there's any kind of like short-term impacts from covid then you want to be able to weather that so buy it for at least five years preferably longer um, so you can actually weather any storm um, yeah that's my that's my goal um, and that's my advice what other impact is very, very difficult to say, but I am convinced that there will be an impact at some point. But until the market was no longer flooded with money and there's a lot of money flowing into the market still, I think that we're seeing an uprising um, uh, uh, in the um, enterprises and more people looking to buy. So, yeah. Robin, how are you? Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm tempted to say what he said. Um, but you no, know, from the mortgage uh, side of things, then obviously the, the main focus will automatically go to interest rates um, and also kind of how banks will perceive your situation. Uh, when it comes to interest rates, they are now very low. They have never been this low. So uh, which, what you can read everywhere, they're historically low. Sure, uh, that is the case. Um, we saw a slight decrease now. I don't expect a large difference between now and one or two years. Um, right now, we see it kind of uh, uh, going up and down, and the most, um, the, the biggest reason right now is not COVID, but it's more the um, season that we're in. So now we saw a slight decrease in interest rates because people come back from their holidays. Also, banks have their employees coming back from their holidays, so they can uh, get a bit more applications and process them as well, um, not to have a very long processing times. 
Um, it could well be that end of year uh, Christmas holiday seasons, when banks met their quotas, that then it will increase by 0.05%, for instance. Well, so that's about the range we can see right now, what we expect. Long term, again, as Kimo said uh, correctly, it's really hard to tell. I've lost my crystal ball to predict the uh, interest rates a long time ago, unfortunately. Uh, so that is definitely something that we honestly don't know. If anybody says they do, then it, that's probably not true. Or they have some crystal ball that I lost. Um, so that's one thing to consider the interest rates. On the other hand, what we saw uh, during COVID as well is that banks do want to know, do want to have some security regarding your income. So when you are self-employed and you just started your business and it might be affected, uh, affected uh, by um, COVID, then sure, it might be that they want to have a bit more questions uh, answered from you. Or if you have a temporary contract in the restaurant business, for instance, or the um, event management business, then they might also want to have a bit more answers about your specific situation. That's about as far as it goes right now. Um, because in the end, banks do want to make money and do want to give out mortgages. So still, there's a kind of balance they want to keep there as well. Yep. Great. Thank you. Then we're going to stick with you, uh, Robin, for this one. Um, well, as we all know, uh, you need to pay a 10% deposit. Yep. What is the 10% deposit that I need to complete? <laughs> yeah, so the 10% um, uh, deposit is regarding the 10% security deposit, and we can see the timeline uh, right now. So um, when so you buy a property, you put in a bid, bid gets accepted, you start your mortgage application, and then your mortgage got approved. Happy days. You see that just about uh, right of the middle, mortgage application approved. Happy days. You have all the security that you need, really, because you know you have the mortgage, you, you can proceed to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the handover. The seller still doesn't really know anything. Uh, essentially, you would be able to just pack your bags and drive into the sunset and never to be heard or seen of again. And then the seller has to start over that whole process again. True, they, you would have to pay 10%, but if you're abroad or somewhere in a far off uh, distant land, then they wouldn't have any option to contact you. For that purpose, there's a 10% security deposit. So that means um, that you usually about four to five weeks after you've signed the purchase agreement, um, that's when you have to um, secure a 10% security deposit at the notary. Uh, that can be out of your own savings if you have it available. Um, if you don't have it available, a financial institution, for instance, the bank you close the mortgage with, can secure this 10% security deposit as well. Um, you do have to pay a one-off fee for that uh, usually, but that's something that will be taken care of in your mortgage application as well. Bear in mind, it's not part of your mortgage. It's completely separate and has to be taken care of separately as well. But that's essentially what it is, a security that you actually move forward with buying this pro uh, property. So then a 10% security deposit is in, uh, has to be set in place. After the key handover has been done, then that 10% uh, will go back to you or go back to the bank that secured it for you. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. Back to you, Kimo, and we'll, we'll follow up with Robin afterwards. Um, can you tell us a little bit about our fees? Yes, we can. Um, so we have two different packages. We have a smart package and we have a complete package. Smart package yeah. is support, but we only kick in once you have viewed a property yourself that you're actually keen to move forward with. This is one of the most popular packages that we have. What we do is we, of course, chat with you before you actually start the process. You have a personal buying manager. Once you have shared which property you want to spend an offer on, we'll do all the research. We'll do the property document review. We'll do the market valuation definition, and then we'll draw off an offer together with you. Then we'll submit that offer. If your offer gets accepted, hooray. We'll also do legal document review, um, and we have help with booking in third party. So the appraiser, title inspector, the notary, and then we'll make sure you understand what it means during the transfer. We'll support you there, uh, but we won't attend any meetings. The complete package, however, is a package that is similar to SMART, but the difference is, is that we actually schedule and book in viewings. We attend viewings, so we'll be there to hold your hand and, well, maybe not hold your hand, we'll give you a fist bump, um, and we'll attend the inspector and notary appointment. So um, this is kind of like a, a unaccompanied uh, package. We charge $24.99 for SMART and $39.99 for complete. No hidden fees, no hidden taxes. This is what you pay, no more, no less. Robin, how about you guys? 
Um, yes, we uh, have a fixed fee of 3,250 euros, and I see we should uh, set up a slide next time. Uh, a fixed fee of 3,250 euros uh, when it comes to purchasing property for uh, up to 1 million or less than 1 million. Because over a million, then the mortgage application process it gets a bit more complicated, and then we work on a fixed fee of 4,000 euros. Now, what do you get for this 3,250? Um, we guide you through the whole process from the moment that you consider buying your house until, well, the 30 years that you owned it and your mortgage has been repaid, really. Um, the first uh, couple of months are the most important, of course. So during the whole house hunting process is something we'll guide you through. If you find any property at any point in time and you think, well, this is something I might be interested in and I might want to do a viewing, feel free to already send me the listing. I will revise the calculations and set, to, uh, set up an overview for you so you already have an indication of what your in mortgage would look like regarding your input of savings, uh, the monthly payments, what kind of fees do you have to consider. And especially, uh, as Kim also already so eloquently put, uh, when you work with Ludo, then I probably already get an indication of what the property value is, which is perfect, because then I can use that um, in my calculations. So what our purpose is, um, in this housing market, you have them act quickly, usually. You do a viewing, and it could well be that in a couple of days, you already have to put in a bid, if it's not the same day. We want to make sure that you already understand what your financial situation is, when you do the viewing or very soon after that really depends on what your preference is because then you can make a quick decision as well and then you might just beat the competition with uh, uh with your bid as well so that's what we do when it comes to um the house hunting process we'll also check the all the specifications and features of the property if anything will uh, impact your mortgage so regarding uh, ground lease we'll discuss with you the um, energy rating the, so how energy sufficient it is the homeowners association will check out and uh, if there's any impact uh, on the mortgage so the guys from expert housing network they know everything about how everything should be regarding the uh, transfer and everything we know everything from how to secure the mortgage so that's a perfect uh, somebody else's uh, how do you say that? Uh, symbiotic synergy, synergy, synergy. synergy. There you synergy, go. Symbiotic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that's uh, that's that's what we do when it comes to the house hunting process. Then we'll also take care of the mortgage application process, of course. Any document that you have to sign for the bank will be in Dutch, by the way. So we'll supply any translations. Uh, no additional fees there, of course. Um, if you need any insurances regarding your um, disability or life term insurance, uh, usually you have to pay additionally for that uh, with any uh, uh, broker or any in, um, uh, insurance company directly. It's around 200 euros per uh, insurance. We don't charge you that because we already have your information just a couple of clicks away and we'll discuss what you need. So that's all included there. And just one additional thing. We uh, always start with an introductory call and then we do uh, a call similar to this that we explain everything about mortgages. And then if you uh, commit to working with us uh, a week or a couple of days uh, later, um, then you also get an early commitment discount and then we charge a level 3000 euros um, so we can uh, work with you uh, based on that. So that's, uh, that's pretty much what we do. Cool. I think you'll need two slides for that. <laughs> True. Awesome. Um, thanks, Robin. Uh, so last questions that we'd love to ask you is your experience. So how likely would you refer this webinar to somebody else? Did you miss anything in the webinar? What would you like to get more information on? By the way, if you have any further questions, pop them in the Q&A. Luda's done a great job answering the majority of them. So that leaves less work for us, which is always good. Um, Ludo, um, please feel free to continue with answering some of these questions. If there's any left, then me and Robin are happy to, well, sorry, Robin and, my, and I are happy to actually answer these questions. Perfect, we're getting some good scores. So this is actually the first time that we're doing this webinar a little bit earlier on the day. Normally we do it in the evening. And one of the things that I've experienced is that um, um, all three of us, Robin, Ludo and I are a little more eloquent and a little more straight to the point <laughs> during the day than in the evening. Um, and it looks like we get we get some good scores as well. I think my parents will be very, very happy to see. I think we're averaging a, um, was it eight and a half, nine here? That's good. Um, did you miss anything? Some people missed some things. I would love to a little bit, know a little bit more about the buying process. Of course, the mortgage process. We have tried to create a webinar that is relevant for everyone um, and not dive too deep into the actual actual processes. Um, again, we're happy to jump on a uh, intake with you guys, free of charge, no strings attached, to share a little bit more and, of course, answer very specific questions. But 
no one gave us a very bad score. So I'm super happy to see that. Thanks everyone. Um, I think we'll uh, hand it over to uh, Ludo after he's finished answering this question. Um, and then we'll see if we can actually answer some questions for you guys. Cool, alrighty. I was indeed just finishing up uh, one last answer and now we're ready to go to, uh, towards some, uh, some live questions. Um, let's start uh, with you, Kimo. I have a question from uh, Tarek. Tarek feels like it is very difficult to find a, um, a property on Funda that is not already sold the next day. Um, do you have any hints or any other websites to look maybe? Um, and also a quite good question, something we get asked uh, quite often, is there a secret place for real estate agents uh, with, uh, with properties online? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't know how you look on Funda, but what I always do is I always filter based on properties that have come on Funda recently. So 24 hours ago today, right? And then what I always do is always book in viewings via Funda as well. Not always call the agent, but book in, book in a viewing via that this little button on the right side that says book in a viewing, then you're in their system. Because um, the majority of the properties still go on fund now. And sometimes real estate agents share, because we received an, e an email the other day about a property that was not on fund yet. Sometimes that happens for sure. Um, but still, you'll see the majority of the properties go on fund now. And uh, make sure you just check it on a daily basis, set up a newsletter that sends new properties to you. But don't wait like a day or two to that like book interviewing because yeah, then 10 or 20 people have gone before you and then it's actually full. Or work with us because we can actually sometimes get you viewings that no longer are optional to book. Um, it's not always the best answer. Sorry, it's very busy at the moment in terms of, of demand on the market. So um, we're also facing that challenge, right? Um, so we'll just have to navigate through that maze and around it. Perfect. Um, then a question for you, Robin, a question from Evan. Uh, Evan lives in Holland, but uh, all of his income is from the US uh, in US dollars. Is it possible for him to get a mortgage in the Netherlands? Uh, hi, Evan. Thanks for your question, first off. Uh, and um, sure, yeah, there are possibilities, uh, to, be, to be sure. Not all lenders uh, allow foreign income or necessarily, uh, more importantly, uh, foreign currency. Um, but there are definitely possibilities. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, by all means, uh, I'd love to take a look for you what, what that would mean for you. Um, there are definitely possibilities if you have um, income from a foreign currency. No problem. Perfect. That's good news. Um, uh, back to you, Kimo. Question from Fiona. Can you tell us a little bit about the differences about buying uh, or between buying a house and buying um, land or without land? And maybe touch on ground lease there as well. Ooh. So the difference between buying a house and buying land. Um, one is freedom. The second is headache. Um, so uh, when you buy a house, then most likely you'll buy something that you can actually see and that you know what condition is in, you can inspect it, you know what the neighbors are like, you know, all these things. Um, of course, uh, you'll buy something that you can't create yourself. Like maybe you can do some change on the inside. Sometimes you can just change to the outside. If you buy a plot and then start building on it, um, I'm not sure if I would actually advise that at this point because um, it's very hard to find good contractors. Material costs have increased rapidly. I think that it's a after effect of um, uh, COVID, like the cost of wood, but the cost of also other things is has gone through the roof. So I think that's, that's something to take into account. So it doesn't always pay off at this point. So I would wait maybe a little bit to actually buy a plot and then build a, build a property on it. Plus, if I know anything about construction, it always takes longer than you think. Plus, if you buy a plot um, and you uh, have a rental, then you'll have double uh, double costs as well in that sense. So um, I would be very, very, very careful if you uh, if you do that. If, it's, if, it's, if, of course, it's your dream, then you can definitely look into it. Um, sometimes uh, municipalities don't allow you to buy plots and they'll allow you to rent a plot. So I think that's what Ludo referred to as well, ground lease. It means it stays in the ownership of the municipality, but you can lease it for a period of time. Um, that's also something that's good to look into. If you do that though, then the amount that you lease it for has an impact on what you can borrow. So talk to Robin and his team about that as well. Um, would I advise doing that? Um, it really depends on where you buy and it really depends on what your plan is when it comes to construction. Also have a look into 
what um, is actually allowed by the municipality, local municipality, because sometimes they have actually planning uh, restrictions or restrictions to what you can actually do. I had a case a couple of uh, a couple of years ago where somebody couldn't build higher than a certain amount, couldn't build wider than a certain amount. So make sure you understand that really well before you buy a plot or anything. So um, definitely get some support. Um, yeah. I hope that answers the question a little bit. For sure. Um, then I have a question for you, Robin. Um, we didn't touch base on it today, but can you tell us a little bit about the financial clause that you can put into an offer? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Um, so when you put in a bid, you can include a financing clause. That means as much as that you say, okay, I'm willing to pay an X amount, uh, but on the condition that as soon as I sign the purchase agreement, I have a certain amount of time, a couple of weeks, usually that's somewhere between two and six weeks time to secure your mortgage. Um, it also means that if you cannot close a mortgage within that time, you can uh, the, the contract will be dissolved and uh, no harm, no foul, no consequence. You can just cancel the purchase agreement, um, yeah, the purchase. Now, as Kimo mentioned, if you put uh, if any any condition in your bid it will make it less interesting to the seller. And right now, it is a seller market. They can just pretty much dictate what happens in the market. So it also means that if uh, a seller gets two bids one with and one without a uh, uh, financing clause, well, they will almost most certainly go with uh, the bit without the financing clause, even if it's a bit lower. If it's a bit lower, they will also try to negotiate between the two, probably, uh, saying, okay, they might go to the other seller saying, okay, I have a bit with, with the financing clause, but I like your bit better. Just if you increase the bit, then it's yours. Or they go to you with the financing clause and say, well, sure, I like your bit, just lose the financing clause and they have a deal. That could be an issue, uh, a situation there. Um, so when you want to have 100% security, go with the financing clause. To be perfectly honest, I like I have a preference for the financing clause as well, but I also know the market. So that's also why we do our uh, the preparation that we do before um, you do a bit uh, when you work with us is quite extensive, because in the end we just want to make sure that you buy the house. So we also want to make sure that we have all the security that we need that you can leave out this financing clause because uh, when conforming to a certain uh, condition then you can definitely lose it uh, lose this financing clause as well and make your bid that much more interesting so make sure that you're well informed before you leave it out and also definitely be informed by uh, a buyer's agent um, to be to check if it's necessary to leave the uh, leave out the financing clause uh, and uh, what that would have as a consequence. Uh, you have to know two things for sure. One, can you close a mortgage? Uh, so is your income sufficient? And two, is the property sufficient to close a mortgage on? So is the value of the property sufficient and is the quality also uh, in order to close a mortgage on? Perfect, cool. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, well, we're heading back to you, Kimo. Um, a question uh, regarding renting. Um, Gufin asks the chances of uh, are the chances of renting a place uh, or renting out a place higher inside of the ring compared to, for example, places like Amsterdam, which is um, well, pretty much outside of the, the ring of Amsterdam, um, or is it relatively the same? I would say chances are a little bit higher inside the ring, but I think that there's a very big community of uh, different nationalities in Amsterdam and depends really what kind of property you have. And I think if you price it well, now it's there's there's, there's a floodgate of internationals and people looking to rent a home. So um, some people might actually want to live in a quieter space, but like I think the majority, especially the young ones, will want to live um, close to the city center. So uh, people up to like 35, 40 uh, couples will maybe want to live there. Um, families and partners that maybe want a little bit more space uh, will want to live in Amstelveen. Um, I think that it's it's gotten better uh, versus the past. Why? Because Amstelveen offers more space and especially with the whole working from home thing, just having that extra room where you can set up your home office makes a lot of sense. So um, I wouldn't rule it out. I think it's definitely a good option. Sure. I grew up in Amstelveen actually, and it's a very, very nice place to live. I can tell you that. He turned out well. <laughs> My parents did their best for sure. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, more question for, for you, uh, Robin, a mortgage related question. Mm -hmm. Is it actually possible to apply for a mortgage with a family member who lives abroad? So doesn't live in the Netherlands? Um, no, 
Uh, the, the thing is that, uh, that, that you need a so-called BSN, uh, a Dutch social security number. Um, so that's one, uh, one um, requirement. If, um, if the um, family member lives abroad and they're Dutch, then there could be made a case. But in the end, um, the thing is that when you buy a house together and you're both on the purchase agreement, then you also both have to be on the uh, mortgage agreement as well. And that's very hard when, you live, when one of you lives abroad. Um, so that's, uh, that is going to be tricky. This family member can help you with financing this property, but then just uh, by using their own funds. So um, uh, savings, for instance, or otherwise, uh, other type of funds. So in a gift, uh, for instance, then there are possibilities. But a family member cannot um, that lives abroad um, cannot be part of the mortgage in the Netherlands. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> guest. My, my guest is saying hello again. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, maybe a question. Uh, well, well, I'm going to ask it for Kimo. Is the uh, do you expect the government to intervene on the housing market um, at all? They're trying to, uh, but please be mindful that we currently have a liberal government in place, and um, I don't know what they're currently doing. They haven't uh, having a hard time enough, kind of like forming a new government. Um, so by the time that has uh, that has that has happened, um, we're most likely close to the end of this year. I don't see any changes anytime soon. Why? Not any major changes from the from the lo from national government. Why? Because their constituency consists mainly of, especially the liberal government, consists mainly of people that want to buy a home or that own a home. So I think they don't want to stir up or kick up that dust anytime soon. What we're doing, what we are seeing, is um, local governments or so municipalities actually trying to figure out how to actually manage this. They have a limited space to kind of like maneuver uh, from a from a from a legal point of view and what we're currently seeing is, is that they're saying that some neighborhoods are um, not for people to buy a home to rent it out so you actually have to live in those in, in the homes that you buy there um, we're also seeing that they're capping uh, rent um, so rental increases can only be a certain amount um, there might be other ways to actually um, uh, improve the, the housing market, but I think it, it really comes down to how attractive do you make it. And in the 70s, we had much like like a higher housing shortage, but housing prices didn't increase that much. Why? Because it was just more expensive to buy a home, right? Uh, interest rates were up. We didn't have all these tax exemptions and so on. So um, it was just less attractive. Um, it didn't mean that it, that it made it easier for people to to, um, to have a home, but it at least kept the balance to some extent. And I think that um, there's there's a lot of different things that uh, need to happen before it's going to heavily impact the housing market. And I don't see that happen anytime soon, especially not from the from the national government. Local governments might apply it, but um, no. Okay. Um, Robin, is uh, do we always get 100% of the purchase price um, as a mortgage? Well, um, not always. That that would be a bit of a stretch. So um, also, it's good to keep in mind that um, uh, purchase price and value don't necessarily have to be the same thing. So that's the first thing. So you purchase a property and then afterwards, uh, an appraiser visits the property to determine the value, property of the value. This appraiser, as Kimo mentioned, they work for you. So they will try to get as close to this pro uh, to the purchase price as possible, but. They are limited to some extent uh, because they will be double checked by an independent agency. So that's one thing to consider. But then just have Ludo <laughs> uh, look into the expected property value, and then you're uh, pretty much good. Uh, uh, so then that's something to to consider. So then you usually can finance up to 100% of the property value. Um, why I say usually that kind of depends on your specific situation and the bank as well. Um, there are a lot of banks out there. We work with over, uh, I think right now with 36 different banks. All banks have different rules and regulations and different conditions. Some banks have uh, a down payment that you always have to do when you're not an uh, EU citizen. Um, so then you have to uh, down pay 10%, for instance. That's not the case with all lenders. So by all means, do your research or have someone do your research for you to check out if you uh, what amount of more you can get. Um, Basically, when you uh, are employed, um, then already uh, you would be able to uh, get a, take out a mortgage for the full 100%. But there are some uh, exemptions there. But uh, basically, yes. Thank you. 
Um, then we have uh, our last question, a question from uh, Marion for you, Kimo. Um, how do you think the uh, housing market will be impacted by the upcoming legislation about uh, purchasing a property to rent uh, out in the big cities for the 1st of January 2022? So, again, I think that's, that what we're trying to do is they're trying to kind of like curb the uh, number of private investors. Um, and I think that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Um, like my personal opinion is a home technically should be lived in. Um, I, I think that um, if a, a legislation goes through that protects at least people uh, uh, from like being outbid by investors, I, I don't necessarily think that is a bad thing, but I don't think that's the solution in itself. It's just one bit of the issue, right? And I think that um, we also have plenty of people that will maybe buy it and then uh, uh, live in it for, for, for a short while and then rent it out. But I think that um, if we can protect people that actually want to buy a home to actually live in to some extent, I think it will definitely help. But again, I think that there, there are other ways to have, have a bigger impact. Um, this, how big of an impact will it have? So maybe, maybe for your information, we already uh, introduced legislation at the beginning of this year that stated that if you were to buy a property as an investment, then transfer tax would be much higher than it was before, right? So I think, what, what is it now? Is it like 8% now, the transfer tax, if you buy a property to invest? So already there, um, we saw a decrease, I think, in, uh, in people wanting to, to buy a property to invest in because you have to make that calculation and it's, it's a little bit more tricky in that sense. So um, I don't know how much impact it will actually have, especially in the short run. Um, I think that, uh, 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 yeah, it depends a little bit per, um, per city as well. So, um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll know six months in. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, all right, then we have one, one final question. Um, and then uh, this one is uh, for Robin. Is it possible to use funds in foreign account in those uh, that are saved from Netherlands income after paying taxes? How tough is it to bring that amount here? Legally, of course. <laughs> Where is it from? <laughs> Very good question. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, tough at all. Uh, so when it comes to bringing money into a country uh, so in, through a wire transfer, that can be quite easy because uh, when it comes to tax authorities, because the tax authorities like uh, likes uh, money coming into the country because then there that helps the economy, right? So that's one thing. Um, using those funds for your um, uh, for the purchase of property uh, or decrease your mortgage, for instance, or use to pay the mortgage uh, fees, for instance, um, that is no problem. Also, the only thing is that uh, when you input a significant amount of savings and it's usually over ten thousand euros. Um, then uh, the most banks will want to have some proof of where those funds came from. So that's the most important thing. So it has to be be able to be backtracked. So where what was what was the origin of the of those funds? Was it a gift from uh, from a relative or somebody that you know, or selling your property in that foreign country? So those can be reasonings. Um, so if it's very uh, uh, clear that it's not legally required acquired, then sure that can be an issue. Um, but this is basically how it works. So the tax authorities they don't necessarily mind if it's a large amount. There might be some inquiry then. There, and the same goes for banks really. They want to know that when they supply your mortgage, then that, that also makes moral sense so that you then didn't get it from uh, illegal activities. That's basically how it works. Cool. Thank you very much. Those were the questions. Wow, that was really good timing, eh? Indeed. Right? <laughs> Great job, everyone. Um, again, if you have further questions or if you wake up tomorrow morning thinking, oh, I should have asked that question, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'll share this presentation. You can book an A and take with us via the presentation. You click on the logos or go to the website. No strings attached, free of charge. We'll help you as best as we can in that sense. Um, everyone have a lovely day. Enjoy your lunch and a lovely weekend ahead. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Ludo. You were great guests. And, Thank uh, you. Denise, have a lovely um Lovely day, everyone, today. You do. Cheers. Thank you. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank you.